Hello everybody and welcome back to another review. This is one about which I'm very, very excited. I know I usually say that I am, but I am particularly excited about this one. And also, it has a bit of a small story to it. Way back when, kind of when I first got onto booktube, I did a review of a book that I really, really liked called Love in the Time of Global Warming by Francesca Leah Block. And at the time when I reviewed it, I was breaking my rule of reviewing a series before it was finished because I didn't actually know this was going to be a series. I thought it was gonna be standalone. Love in the Time of Global Warming is a kind of post-apocalyptic, re-spinning, retelling of The Odyssey by Homer. And I said in my review that I thought it was so well done, executed beautifully, and all the in-world and out-world references to The Odyssey were just like pitch perfect. I loved it. Five out of five stars. Like everybody needs to go and read this book. Well, I found this out, this bit out later. Somebody had sent that video to Ms. Block. And so next thing I knew, one day I open up my phone because it pings at me and I was like, hey, that's an unusual ping. I don't even know what that ping is. But seriously, does your iPhone have a ping at you and you don't exactly know what it's trying to tell you? Right, so my iPhone pinged at me. And it pinged me and it said, you have a friend request on Facebook. And I was like, oh, okay. And it said, Francesca Leah Block. I pinched myself many times, thought I was going crazy, hit accept and was just like, what, what, what? I felt rather like David Tennant's doctor. And then she also later then friend found me on Twitter and basically asked me if I wanted a review copy of The Island of Excess Love. I have mentioned multiple times, one of my most anticipated books coming out this fall. So I of course said yes, was totally overwhelmed. In comes a package from Macmillan and it has The Island of Excess Love. I was so excited. And then the next day, I got another package from Macmillan that had a paperback copy of Love in the Time of Global Warming and another copy of The Island of Excess Love which I was not anticipating. And I'm sort of like, oh my gosh, I can't believe this just happened. <laughs> I don't have the paperback copy of this with me because I've actually lent it to a girl I work with who we got on the topic of epic poetry. We're talking about the Odyssey and things, she says how much she loved it. And I said, have you read this book? She said, no, I said, I have a paperback copy. I will lend it to you. And um, my other copy of The Island of Excess Love, I was really happy to have because I didn't annotate it. This one I annotated. So today we're going to talk about The Island of Excess Love, the sequel to Love in the Time of Global Warming, which is inspired not by the Greeks, but by the Romans. It is a book that is very highly inspired by and only very loosely based upon The Aeneid by Virgil. Like when I reviewed Love in the Time of Global Warming, let's talk about the context. The Aeneid by Virgil is an epic poem that was originally written, yes, written, not just told orally, in 12 books, in Latin, in the Homeric style, so obviously in the style of Homer, whose two epic poems were the Odyssey and the Iliad. Virgil's not only paying homage to the style of Homer, he's kind of in a way directly trying to one-up Homer. And that's best shown actually in the very opening of the Aeneid, where in the opening of the Aeneid, Virgil says, I sing of arms and of a man. His way of saying, okay, Homer did the I sing of a man with the very opening of the Odyssey, sing to me, O muse, of the man of twists and turns. And then with the Iliad singing about a war story, when he opened with rage, sing to me, muse, the rage of Peleus' son, Achilles. Virgil sang, Homer sang of war, and then he sang of a guy. I'm gonna tell you about both in one epic poem. By the way, I'm also going to be kissing Octavian's imperial ass. <laughs> this is what's known as a foundation story. It's laying a new foundation, not only for the creation of Rome, but for the establishment of the Augustan, Octavian, Caesarian line by saying, hey, look, they're actually descended from this great Trojan hero who helped found the city. So that's why they totally should be empowered. It's like all good with the gods. Hey, there's a lot of sucking up to Emperor Augustus in this, especially when they journey to the underworld. Like with the Odyssey, a lot actually happens in the Aeneid. It tells the story of Aeneas, whom we meet up with. He has just arrived in Carthage, which is in North Africa, after having escaped from the destruction of Troy. He meets up with Queen Dido and basically tells her the whole story of how he got there. So we do start in media res and Aeneas says, okay, so here's how Troy fell. Here's why I survived and why I left. And here's the few things that happened before I got here. And now I'm here. The story of the fall of Troy and Aeneas' subsequent love affair with Dido are perhaps the most famous parts of the Aeneid, comprising books two to four. Those are the three books you will most likely read if you are to study the Aeneid. I myself have studied the Aeneid three times. I studied first books two to four 
in my world literature studies, I actually spent my final year of Latin translating the entirety of this beast. And then also I studied it again in a mythology course and we sort of touched on a couple of various books in this thing, not just two to four, we hit some of the later ones as well. Because after Aeneas does leave Dido, he has to journey to the underworld, he travels to a whole bunch of different locations, and then he lands finally in Latium, or La where you'd get the name of the people, the Latins, and eventually you get Rome, and he has to basically fight a mini homecoming war, like in a way to say, yes, we belong here, I'm establishing this as my new country. Aeneas as a hero is very, very different from the Greek heroes in that the Greek heroes were sort of personalities amplified and they were much more flawed than Aeneas is. The Greeks were actually really okay with particularly flawed heroes. Yes, they were meant to be these paragons of humanity, but they also represented all the foibles and flaws within humanity. Look at most of the Greek heroes, they all have these massive flaws. Odysseus is too proud and gives away his name too easily, which also means he's kind of cocky and arrogant. You've got Achilles, whose main flaw is his rage, which becomes so uncontrollable that he does things which are horrific even to the Greeks. Heracles, who was half wild. Theseus, who would was, uh, Theseus had a lot of issues. So did Jason. Jason is actually the subject of his own epic, the Argonautica, which was written by Apollonius of Rhodes. Aeneas, on the other hand, his biggest flaw is that he doesn't believe in himself. That's it. He's pretty much perfect in every other way. It's literally just that he keeps doubting himself. He has a lot of self-doubt. That's his biggest flaw as a hero. And thus we get to the Island of Excess Love, where Pen, short for Penelope, who was our Odysseus of sorts of the first book, steps into her role as essentially the metaphorical Aeneas. Ms. Block says herself in her little afterword that not every character of this book lines up with a particular character of the Aeneid, but without question I think Pen is Aeneas. She's constantly doubting her abilities of being a, a leader and a hero. She is called a hero, she's kind of meant to be this epic hero, but she's much more a hero in the Roman tradition than she is in the Greek. If anybody in this book is a hero of the Greek tradition, it's Hexane, or Hex, whom is her no longer whom he once was lover. I say Hexane is a hero much more in the Greek tradition because he reminds me of an Achilles. I'm going to read a passage from near the ending of the book where we are in our own metaphorical underworld and the characters are all saying we are heroes because we have this ability, we have this gift. And speaking of Hex, Hexane is a fighter, the king says. Show me. Xandra holds out a sword. It's forged of metal with crystals embedded in the hilt. The king bows his hooded head and gestures for Hex to take the sword. But before we actually see this exchange, Hex is poised in front of Xandra and the tip of the sword has pierced her chest. I gasp. Hex pulls the sword out. There's no blood anywhere, not even a tear in Xandra's garment. She looks down at her chest and smiles. Very nice work. You are a fighter, young man. Fighting prowess like that is A, a true sign of some sort of epic hero, B, really reminds me of Achilles. Achilles was said to be literally the greatest fighter that ever lived because he was a demigod. His mother was a nymph, the sea nymph Thetis. And Hexane really strikes me as an Achilles, not only with the fighting prowess, but that he's a fairly quick to anger character, oftentimes with good reason, but he is fairly quick to anger and he tends to go off and brood and he's betrayed in various ways. All I was seeing was Achilles from the Iliad. Let's be honest, Achilles in the opening of the Iliad is throwing a bitch fit because Agamemnon took the woman whom he stole from Troy and claimed her as his own. Not that Agamemnon is necessarily a very nice character, but literally they're fighting over a woman whom they see as property. And Achilles says, fine, I'm not gonna fight for you anymore. Yeah, what about that honor and stuff? Hexane, much more a hero in the Greek tradition, which I found interesting in that this book is inspired by a Roman epic and obviously the Roman hero Aeneas is very different. It's Pen without question. She's constantly doubting herself. This is all about Pen coming into her own, realizing just how powerful she is. The king actually says to Penelope, Penelope, are you sure? I don't want this to be imposed on you. I want you to know your own great power. Story-wise, this book picks up pretty much right where love in the time of global warming left off. I think some time has passed. I'm thinking months is what I'm getting has passed. And just as everybody's starting to kind of get comfortable with their weird lifestyle, this mysterious ship appears on the shore and 
in a sort of trance-like way ensnares all of them to go on this adventure and land on this very mysterious island which they call the Island of Love, ruled over by a man who's called the King. We don't learn his name until later, it is actually Dylan, but the King seems to have this way of putting people under his spell. There is a line in here which sort of got me thinking. There's a line here where essentially Hex has left. <laughs> he's left Penelope and the others and he's left a note saying, yeah, I'm leaving, bye. And Penelope's so upset, the king goes to comfort her, and he's just like... And Penelope says, Bring him back. Can you bring him back? Now I'm pleading. I have no other choice. I'm sorry. That's one of the things I can't do for you. Not if he doesn't want it. Not if he doesn't want it. I found that to be the one of the most important lines that the king has to Penelope. Because it tells me that... His power is based on pre-existing desires. His illusions are essentially amplified desires that already exist within the person. So if Hex doesn't want to come back, he can't make him do something against his will, against his desires. In this case, the king really takes on the role of a Dido character. So as you can imagine, and if you could not tell from the cover, he and Pen have a kind of affair that occurs on the island in what is probably one of the most erotic scenes I have ever read in a book. No, not just saying why a book, I mean just in a book in general. And I've read The Bronze Horseman, and I've read Outlander, and I've read some things which contain some very erotic or sexually explicit scenes. Dang. Now, as I said, I have studied the Aeneid. There is an entire sequence in one of the books of the Aeneid between Aeneas and Dido where basically they go into a cave and have sex. They're watched by Hera and several other goddesses and nymphs, and so Dido actually calls it marriage and all the things that go on from that point. No, the story of Dido really doesn't end up well for her. So as you can guess, if the king is playing Dido, it doesn't end so well for the king. But because I had read the Aeneid, I had my eyes open for various points where I could be, hey, that's directly coming from the Aeneid, or I see where we've been influenced by the Aeneid. So I knew that cave scene was coming, so I wasn't surprised. And I'm also a fairly open-minded person when I read, and so I wasn't bothered by it in the slightest. It actually made sense with everything that was going on in the book, but it was a very beautiful scene. And I think beauty is the one word I can really use to describe this book, besides just art. The writing is so beautiful, it's poetry. Francesca Lea Bloch has essentially created the modern epic poem in her retellings and re-spinnings of these old epic poems. This read more like a long piece of poetry that at the same time was telling me a story. This is very loosely inspired by the Aeneid. A lot of it is actually based around Dido, the stay with Dido. Perhaps the most well-known of all the books of the Aeneid is the stay in Carthage and the romance between Dido and Aeneas. And so that dominates this book and it's glorious. It's absolutely beautiful to read, so perfectly described, and as you can see by these tabs, I was making notes in this thing like a crazy person. I mean, I was taking notes, and not just tabs, highlights, actual notes, everywhere in this book, because I felt like, it felt like I was reading for an English class. I kept my handy copy of the Aeneid with me and so was frequently going back and paralleling the two stories and making sure that I wasn't missing anything while I was reading. That was so much fun for me. I don't think I've ever had so much fun reading a book in a very long time and a book that I was reading for pleasure. It's not like I was reading it for study. I wanted to read it with the Aeneid. I wanted to have a guide. What I also like is that this book has an ending that is definitely left a little open so I have some hope that maybe we're going to get a third book, maybe based around the Iliad. As I said, I've seen Hexane very much as a kind of Achilles character, so I'm maybe hoping we can get an Iliad where Hex really comes into that role. Granted, it does not end well for Achilles in the long run, but not necessarily in the Iliad. If anybody knows the Iliad, you know that it ends at the funeral of Hector, with the understanding of basically everything that's gonna come after, but hey. <laughs> Achilles is still alive at the end of the Iliad. I mean, I'm just, I'm just saying. But the Iliad, third book, Iliad. I'm, 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 I'm hoping that'd be really cool. Just, I'm gonna throw that out there. There are some things that I do think are left open 
for a third installment. Though, like Love in the Time of Global Warming, this book closes up really beautifully, and that's something I really like. I don't like being left on cliffhangers all that much, they tend to drive me a little crazy, but the fact that this is a fairly self-contained story makes me so happy. If you haven't started checking out this series by Francesca Lea Block, there is a big hole in your life and you're missing out, because especially if you are a fan of things like the Odyssey and the Iliad and mythological or fairy tale respinnings and retellings, because these are doing it to a degree that literally puts almost everything else to shame. I sort of look at these and go, it's the modern epic poem. That's what this is. The writing is so beautiful, the characters so diverse and well-developed oh goodness they are so well fleshed out i knew all of these characters they weren't just sort of empty shells that were standing in as filler to say like oh this is our aeneas character so let's just not do anything more than just you know you'll know it's the aeneas character we don't need to do more oh no 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 these characters are very much their own and they learn very hard lessons and go through so many trials and tribulations it's just glorious but that is all from me today you guys and so until next time Cheers.